Hey folks, uh, it's been a tough week or so, hasn't it? I mean, honestly, this wasn't the talk I was planning to do this week at all. Last week we talked about doing something different, but I, I just really feel like I need to address for us what's going on in culture and uh, try to give some parameter, try to give some framework, try to give some response uh, to that. And I, I don't know about you, if you, how you have felt the weight of it. Um, I mean, maybe a little bit here in Maine, we're, at least our part of Maine, maybe a little bit inoculated from it, but not entirely. I mean, there have been things, protests that have happened in Belfast and Rockland and, and other places around us, so it's not like it's totally not here in terms of the protest. And, and I'm talking, obviously, about the, the murder of George Floyd and uh, how do we respond to what's going on in culture. I, I want to say this, uh, and I might meander some because I haven't scripted this all out. Uh, me as a white person, I, I really don't completely fully understand maybe some of what the burdens are, and the pains are that some people feel. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not Jewish in, in my background, so I don't understand all the, the angst and the horrors of the Holocaust. I mean, I can see it. Uh, I can go to Washington, D.C., and, and I to Dachau or places like that and to concentration camps and, and have that sense of understanding, but, but to personally possess it, it's just not there. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a black person, a uh, person of color. And, uh, you know, I, while I completely, vehemently disagree with the, the ravages and the wrongness of slavery as it took place in America, uh, and all the torture and all the torment of, of, of black uh, African Americans, African Americans at that point in time, being brought from Africa to America, uh, I still don't understand all of the, the pain, residual pain that is now 400 years uh, later, 200 years later, uh, a part of still the heritage of, of that people group. I, 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 I can see it, I can try to embrace it, I can try to understand it, but I can't feel what, what they feel. Um, I'm not a Japanese American whose parents were uh, interred in California at the start, uh, at the American start in World War II after Pearl Harbor was bombed, I, and all the, the frustration and the pain that came through that. I, I don't know the, the, the residual feelings that may be a part of that. Or I'm not Mexican, or I'm not from uh, the Middle East, or I'm not from, from India. I mean, the, the country, the, the continent of India, I'm not from there. Getting the, the stares and the glances and the glares that sometimes those folks get when we look at them because they dress differently or, or wear a head covering or things of that nature. Uh, I can try to understand, but I don't know what they feel. And, and honestly, none of us really know what, what folks in that situation feel, or, or Native Americans uh, who lost their lands and, and who had treaties given to them, and then the treaties were subsequently just thrown out the window. And I, There's a lot of pain in people's lives, but you know, none of this is new. It, it all goes back not only hundreds of years, but thousands of years. You read through the scriptures and, and you see all of the, the warfare and, and all the, the, the problems between people groups, between the Edomite, Edomites and the Israelites would be an example of that. The, the people of Esau, the people of Jacob. It's there. It's a real thing. Humanity is plagued and troubled with, with dissension, with warfare, with envy, with strife. It is there. And that is... That is what Christ came to answer. That is the solution he came to give. Now, we look around at us and, and we see people uh, protesting. We see peace, peaceful protests. Uh, but then we also see the violence and the looting and all those things that, that only seem to contribute to the angst that is there. Now, some would say, well, they're trying to get the attention that they've never gotten. They're trying to get people to sit up and to listen and and. You know, does violence really accomplish that end? Uh, you have to wonder, would Martin Luther King be rolling over in his grave looking at that and what is happening? I mean, I don't want to come across as an answer person. I want to come across as a question person, except for this. Except for the fact that, that Christ, who was the, the maker of all peoples, Christ who came for all peoples, 
Christ who was sent by the God who loved the entire world. Christ who was sent by the God who said, I want people from every tribe and tongue and language and nation to be a part of my family. I mean, this is God. This is, this is the truth of the word of God. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. In chapter 7, verse 9, he talks about people from every tribe and language and people and nation. The Great Commission talks about people of every nation. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him, any tribe, any language, any nation, any people group, any ethnicity, God so loved the world. And for us as Christians, we have to approach the entirety of the situation from the vantage point of God and God's love for people and God's acceptance of humanity. Now, now Christ came to answer sin, and that is the problem. I mean, that is the underlying problem of, of what goes on. It is our pride, it is our arrogance, it is our, our, our uh, lack of ability to apply two ears and one tongue. It, it is our lack of ability to want to understand oftentimes. I had a friend, his name was Johnny Gerhard, and Johnny uh, was a white guy uh, who went to New Orleans to work uh, among black people in New Orleans. And he taught us, we went down to, to visit with their ministry there. He said, this is what I've learned. These words, help me understand. I'm trying to understand. I don't understand. Help me understand. And I think that's a posture that we need to come into this situation with. Uh, because we don't know. You say, well, racism isn't that bad. Well, it's worse than what you and I think. I have talked to friends right here in our, own, in our own local area that are black, that have been profiled. People that you would be surprised that they were profiled. But it happens. The looks, the stares, all of those things, they're a reality of, of culture. In, in other places, it is far worse than it is for us, perhaps right here in Maine, but it's reality. What is God's answer? God's answer is the gospel. God's answer is humility. God's answer is crying out and acknowledging our sinfulness. And, and even us that are Christians, we need to be able to acknowledge our own sinfulness, our own sometimes disregard for people, our own disregard for people that are different than us. We do it to people on a political basis. We do it to people sometimes on an ethnic basis. Sometimes we do it uh, on a financial or socioeconomic basis. We have a, a different regard for people. But yet, God has called us to love all people. And, and one of the things that Jesus makes clear in the scriptures, in, in the story of the Good Samaritan, located in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, is that we're to love our neighbors. He was asked the question, what do I need to do? In fact, let me read that to us because it is one of those passages that really uh, illustrates the heart that God wants us to have for people. It's in Luke chapter 10, the story of the Good Samaritan, and this is what it says. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? And the man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbors as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and just who is my neighbor? In his reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where he was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Jesus said, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the fellow who fell into the hands of the robbers? 
The expert in the law replied, the man who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. He's telling us exactly what we need to do. We need to be that type of good neighbor. And just who is our neighbor? That's what this man asked. Jesus replied, anybody you come across that has a need, that's your neighbor. It isn't just the person that lives in the next door house or in your cul-de-sac. Wait, we live in Maine. We don't have cul-de-sacs. Um, on your road. That isn't what he's talking about. He, he's, he, he is saying, anybody you come across that has this need, that is your neighbor. In fact, in this setting, perhaps you could even say a person of a, diff a different ethnic background, perhaps even especially somebody of a different ethnic background because of the, ethnic the ethnicity between the people and the, the, the strife between the Samaritans and the Jews. And, and yet Jesus espouse the Samaritan as the good neighbor. Should we as Christians be those good neighbors? I say, yes, we should. The words of Jesus are clear that we're to love our neighbors as ourselves. Jesus went even further than that in his call to those who would follow him. Those who chose to follow after Christ must also have a different regard for their enemies. Uh, in Matthew, the fifth chapter, Jesus addresses this. And, and these are challenging words for us that, honestly, as a pastor, sometimes I look around at Christians and think, you don't know this stuff. We need to know this stuff. We need to practice this stuff. We don't need more teaching. We need to just take the simple teaching that Jesus gives here and apply it to our lives. He says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than the others? Do not even the pagans do that? Let me read to you the, the uh, translation that comes from the message. This is the message paraphrase. He says, you're familiar with the old written law that says love your friend and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. Jesus says, I am challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer. For then you are working out your true selves, your God-created selves. That's what God does. He gives his best, the sun to warm and the rain to nourish, to everyone regardless, to the good and to the bad, to the nice and to the nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect to get a medal or a trophy? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. In a word, what I'm saying is, grow up. You are kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously. Live graciously toward others the way that God lives toward you. I think that paraphrase helps us understand so much the heart of God. He wants us to love people. He wants us to understand people. He wants us to understand people that are different than us. He wants us to, to even love and pray for and care for our enemies. That's what makes us different. Now, there's so much more that we can say from a biblical basis to help us navigate these days. The scriptures in the Old Testament talk about how we should love justice and mercy and walk humbly with our God. We certainly need to be humble people. We certainly need to be prayerful people. Our heart should break for what is happening in our land. It should push us to prayer. It should push us to a place of our own repentance, our own confession, and a crying out to God. Now, while I say all this, and before I conclude, I do want to say a few other things. I don't know how all that's happening in our world factors into the end times. I know certainly, if nothing more, it's a precursor to what will come in the end. I know that it's setting us up toward the world stage that does need to be established before Christ will return. 
Does it mean he's coming back next week? I don't know. Does it mean he's not coming back for 100 years? I don't know that either. But what I do know is this. Every breath we take is a breath closer to that day. And what I also know is that every decade we have spun, uh, sped faster and faster toward that end. You look at COVID. You look at the economy. You look at, at the protests that are happening or have happened this week in our country. Where is it all leading? You look at the civil unrest. Is it leading us closer and closer to that place to where the people of the world will say, someone save us? We know there is a Savior. His name is Jesus. We also know that the scriptures tell us that people will look to somebody else, someone that will be revealed after the rapture of the church. His name is the Antichrist. Is the world being established toward that end? It could be. What I would say to you is this. Be ready. Today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want to encourage you with everything that I've said. The, the call to the Christian life, the call to something far different than what we see in our world. Sometimes, sadly, that we even see among Christians. I want to encourage you to consider the call, of the words that Jesus gave to us today in these passages that we've looked at. I also want to encourage you to consider the fact that, that all these things do lead toward the establishment of a world stage, and someday Christ will return. Someday Christ will come to take his church out. Would you be ready for that day? I have friends that have on their kitchen table, I have friends that have on, on a shelf as you walk into their home, a book that says, if we disappear, read this. Now, I want to encourage you about the fact that, that they are leaving that information for people that are left behind. The Bible talks about people who will be left behind. Could that be you? I hope it's not. I hope that you don't have to go through the tribulation that the Bible promises will come. I hope that you would instead say, you know what, I'm going to give my life to Christ right now so that when he takes his church out, I'll be one of those that go with him. And how do you do that? You acknowledge that Jesus Christ is in fact God. You realize that Jesus Christ is in fact the Savior of all who call on him. You acknowledge that he shed his blood so that you could be forgiven of your sins and you give your life to him. And you say, Christ, I'm going to follow after you. Today, if you will do that, you could become a Christian. You could become one who would know that when Christ returns, you'll be forever together with him in eternity. But if you're a Christian and you have not been living according to God's word, I want to call you to come back to God's word. If you, you're a Christian and you have not had this type of regard for your enemies, I want to ask you to consider the truth of God's word and to apply it to your life. Someone said to me earlier today, based on some of this truth I was sharing, well, what am I supposed to do with it? And I said, simple, live it. Jesus tells us exactly what he wants us to do. Christian, are we doing it? How are we doing it at bringing healing? How are we bringing, how are we doing at bringing light? How are we doing at bringing hope to the world around us and how we regard the people around us? Would you pray with me, please? Lord, I pray for anybody that might give their life to Christ right now, that they would acknowledge you as God, they would acknowledge you as Savior, they would acknowledge you as Lord, they would confess to you their sins and make a commitment to follow after you today. Not only so they could avoid the, the days of tribulation that are to come, but so that they could know their sins are forgiven, so that they could be made a new creation and become a follower of Christ. Lord, I pray for all of us that are Christians, that you would help us to be light, help us to be salt, help us to be hope, help us to be healing, help us to demonstrate the love of God to everyone around us. Lord, we know that these are complex issues. We know that these are complex days. But Lord Jesus, you've spoken very clear words to us about our posture and about our practices. Help us to follow your pathway, to do the things that you call us to do, to point people to you. Overwhelm our hearts with your love. And Lord, we do acknowledge our hearts are broken for our country. We acknowledge that our hearts are broken for our world. We cry out to you, forgive us of our sins. We cry out to you for mercy. We cry out to you for healing. 
We cry out to you for uh, spiritual awakening. We cry out to you for revival. We cry out to you to heal our land. Lord, hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, I hope that in the days ahead that you will take to heart, what does the scriptures teach? How do we respond? How do you respond? That you would maybe be more cognizant of, of, of maybe your own attitudes and actions around other people that are different than you. And that you would say, God, help me to have a heart to understand. Ears that listen. Tongues that ask questions so that we can understand. Well, church, let's be the church in the days ahead. Thanks for joining us today.